So for those who've followed my channel for a while, uh, know that I've long been an advocate of Georgism, the uh, economic principles of Henry George, regarding the idea that uh, the land is common to all and should be, uh, and that uh, the rental value of land should be taxed fully so as to uh, take away the privilege of the landlords and ultimately the capitalists so as to give workers the full product of their labor and uh, all societies share the land in common. Um, I still happen to believe that the economic analysis of Georgism is flawless. Uh, as or as flawless as a uh, as any economic system can be, um, the problem is that it lacks any analysis of power. Because you see, I th I think that um, if you could implement a full a system of full land value taxation, where all rents are rendered to the commons and uh, and no one can privately profit off of rent. Um, this would so fundamentally destroy the privilege of, uh, of the power elite that it would radically transform society. But the problem is it's a reformist position, which means you're basically asking the power elite to voluntarily give up their privilege. So anytime you do that, it's just going to be a fundamentally losing proposition. Uh, now, I mean, Georgism, land value taxation has been partially implemented in some places like Estonia, like Taiwan, uh, you know, certain, certain locales even, even in the U.S. and Harrisburg, uh, Pennsylvania has, has had it, but only you know, to a small degree, not nearly to the degree that uh, the Georgians advocate and you know, to the degree that, that would actually cause radical transformations of society. And we can see why. I mean, uh, having a little bit of land value tax can help stabilize an economy and um, you know, that, that can be good for business. But, uh, but they will never allow it to be implemented to a degree that would actually undermine the privilege of, uh, of the power elite. Uh, reformism only works to the degree that it doesn't threaten privilege. Um, and so that's why I've shifted gears and said towards a revolutionary approach. Um, and that's where, that's the role I think that Occupy plays. Um, so... Uh, one one thing that is central to the Occupy movement is direct action, which should not be confused with protest. You protest something when you're um, demanding something from the existing system. You're making demands. You're at, you're asking you know for uh, for the people in power to change something. Direct action does not recognize the authority of the uh, of the of the people you're going against. You simply take what's rightfully yours. You you take action without regard for their permission, um, and that's like what the port shutdown was. Uh, you know, that's uh, when we shut down banks on uh, November seventeenth. That was direct action. So, uh, you know, that that's a huge part of Occupy. Um, another thing which I think uh, Occupy contains the seeds of, but which really needs to be developed more, is uh, a dual power strategy. Now, what dual power is, is basically, you'd, so you, you have a system with existing um, existing infrastructure, existing institutions that serve the elite but aren't really working for ordinary people. Um, you know, a monetary system, a banking system, roads and freeways, and uh, you know, systems of, of, of finance and, uh, and, and of commerce and things. Um, so instead, what you do is build alternative institutions, counter institutions, uh, to uh, compete with the existing system. Uh, so you organize worker co-ops, um, neighborhood co-ops, um, networks of mutual aid, and um, get people to rely more and more upon that competing system until they eventually choose that over the system they've relied on before. Which brings you to a third point. Um, which needs to ultimately happen, uh, which is syndicalism. Now, syndicalism in its most literal sense simply means unionism, but as a, strat as a revolutionary strategy, it really means radical unionism as typified by the industrial workers of the world, or the IWW. Uh, what the IWW uh, advocates is one big union where all workers in all, in all industries uh, you know, join under, under one union 
um, and coordinate their efforts so that uh, they can have general strikes where a critical mass of workers, uh, it doesn't have to be all workers in, in the economy, but just a critical mass of workers to be stop working and bring the capitalist system to his knees. And then they can take over the factories, take over their workplaces, and um, seize the means of production for themselves. And of course, uh, having a dual power strategy in place so that uh, there are means by which they can uh, get their food and their, uh, their supplies and you know go about their lives without needing the state or, or the capitalist institutions uh, makes the general strike all, all the better because then you can actually just uh, shift over to the, those alternative means and have a permanent general strike, which means just basically complete revolution, complete overthrow of the system. Um, so, okay, but when, so suppose the revolution uh, succeeds and we have this anarchist society that I'm advocating. Um, what, uh, would there be kind of revolutionary Georgism or anarcho-Georgism? Well, uh, it is possible. I, in, in my uh, first video on anarchism, I mentioned the idea of land co-ops. Uh, I think that's still an idea that might be worth pursuing, but I'm not so sure, certain that would be necessary anymore. Um, see, in an anarchist society, uh, it would be a system based on uh, cooperative federations of, uh, of businesses, and uh, I mean, you, you could still have a, a market. I've talked about the idea of mutual credit in order to develop for price for price system, but it's also a, a system of mutual aid. So it would fundamentally shift from a competitive society to a cooperative society. Um, and um, the kind of rent-seeking behavior that Georgism is seeking to uh, combat is really fundamentally a feature of the sort of Hobbesian world that, uh, uh, that is brought about by capitalism, where it's sort of every person for themselves. you got to get ahead, and someone else you know, is competing against you to get ahead, and it's... Um, and sort of uh, you know killer be killed kind of and kind of attitude, um, whereas in a cooperative society as typified by an anarchist society, uh, it would be fundamentally based on um, mutual aid, where your security is tied to your mutual reliance on other people, and in such an atmosphere, um, I, I don't think people would have such a hostile attitude towards others that they would try to deprive others of access to land that is needed by uh, by more people in common. So I think l land would naturally be put towards its highest and best use by people who have an interest in putting it to its highest and best use. And um, there would be... Um, you know, so, so, it, so fundamentally, you know, the uh, the, the forces that Georgism is seen in combat just wouldn't be present in any uh, in any degree that, that that would be necessary to combat it. I mean, it, basically, in the kind of antisocial behavior that comprises rent seeking, I think, would be a losing proposition for someone in an anarchist society. So, um, in, in short, I think that uh, the problem with Georgism is. Uh, the power structure that makes it necessary also makes it impossible. And uh, overcoming that power structure would make it no longer necessary. So, that's with us for now. Peace out.